much pastor for allowing us to come and share this morning um, it's good to see all your smiling faces everybody smile real quick so I'm not a liar <laughs> thank you um, I love that the Methodist Church does the child uh, the children time every Sunday I am equally glad that my children didn't come up this morning because I get so nervous when they get asked questions what's gonna come out of their mouth and uh, what sweet responses today that Christmas isn't about the gifts, it's about Jesus. Um, you're doing a great job, church, for training your children on what it really means to be a follower of Christ. This morning, if I could, I would love to share with you for a few moments about my family, the journey we've been on, the organization that we work with, the country that we work in, and then I would love to um, share with you about hope and how we are trying to spread the hope of Jesus Christ in Haiti where we work. Rachel and I have been uh, married almost 18 years and we've been in full-time ministry for almost 17 years. And we've had the great pr privilege of working as youth pastors and associate pastors um, in Illinois, in Virginia, and Arizona. And a few years ago, while we were associate pastors in Arizona, God began to speak to our hearts about becoming full-time missionaries. And I remember the process of it because we had a small group that met in our home every Monday night. And almost every time we opened the scripture, it was pointing towards Jesus saying, go feed the hungry, take care of the poor, help those that are in need, help those that are less fortunate. So we began to pray and to seek God and say, God, what are you, what are you, where are you wanting us to go? What do you want us to do? And he said, full-time missions. So we began the process of selling our house, selling our car. We had 3,000 yard sales trying to get somebody else to buy our junk. <laughs> and it, it was a long process. And we didn't even really know where we were going to go. And then we had a friend of ours who went to Haiti with Happy Kids International. And while he was there, he went to a little orphanage that has 65 kids in it. And a little girl crawled up on his lap, and he was just holding her and hugging her. And he looked down at her arm, and he could see worms crawling underneath her skin. And he came back, and he told us about this. And we were like, well, let's go to Haiti as a short-term missions trip and see if we can help out. It was funny, uh, Papa, as we call him, Reverend Mike, um, at our house, he asked Lydia, he said, what do you do with the kids? He sa she said, well, we give them medicine for worms. And he goes, you give them worm medicine? She goes, no, silly Papa, we give the kids medicine. But for $1 a year, you can deworm a kid with this little white pill. And that's what Happy Kids has started to do, is to go to these different places and deworm the kids because the nutrition gets stolen by the worms, and it causes malnutrition for the kids. But we, we went to Haiti um, on a short-term missions trip and saw just the devastation of the country that we were working in. And the director of Happy Kids met us and helped us lead the team. And we, did, we went to work in orphanages. We poured a concrete floor in a school, met with pastors. And it was just an eye-opening experience for us. Well, the, the director of Happy Kids knew what our heart was and our desire to go and serve those less fortunate. So he said, why don't you come back to my house when we, when we get back to the United States and let's talk about the opportunity to come and work with us. So the five of us took off, and he lived in California. And we drove out there, and we met with him, and we really appreciated his heart, his vision, 
for what Happy Kids was doing in Haiti. And I, I remember I pulled my little family together because he says, why don't you come and serve with us? And I said, well, let us pray about it, and then I'll, I'll let you know in the morning. So I pulled our little family together, and we just had a, just a sweet little prayer time. It was, it was just a real intimate moment with, with our family. And I asked each one of them, I said, what do you think about God opening the door to go to Haiti? And to my surprise and delight, each one of them said, yes, Dad, let's go. God is calling us to go to Haiti. And then my son, who's a little bit of a jokester, he said, Dad, when we move to Haiti, we're going to adopt a boy, and we're going to name him Joe. Now, I had a great time in this prayer, little intimate prayer time, but I wasn't feeling that. I was like, well, maybe God's speaking something to my son that... He's trying to tell me I just need to be open, but I knew that my son's a little bit of a jokester. So I was curious. I said, Levi, why would you say that? He said, that way we can say, hey, Joe, what do you know? <laughs> and I cannot tell you the relief that came over in my life. <laughs> Whew, don't have to adopt a kid named Joe. But each one of my, my family members has been a great inspiration in this process of selling all of our stuff, um, moving to a third world, world country. And Levi, obviously, he provides a lot of the humor and joy into it. My youngest daughter, Lydia, is a fearless person. And it scares me to death. <laughs> she is not afraid to do anything, to try anything. The word caution is not in her vocabulary or existence. And I have to tell you, in the process of moving our family there, I've drawn from that because there's times when I doubt. There's times that I'm afraid. But I know that my little daughter is there and saying, let's go. No questions asked. Let's just go. And then I have my 13-year-old daughter, Anna. <clears throat> She's one of the most precious kids and, and selfless people I've ever met in my life. For her last birthday in the United States, she had a bunch of friends, and, and we lived in Arizona, and she invited them all over. And when they came over, she said, please don't buy me presents. What I would like to do for my birthday is put homeless bags together, and then we can go pass them out. I was like, what 13-year-old kid does that? So instead of bringing her iTunes money or games or clothes and all those things that 13-year-old girls love, she said, please bring socks, deodorant, toothpaste, and we'll put little bags together and go pass them out. And then I have my beautiful wife, Rachel, who inspires me in more ways than I could even have time to share with you this morning. But she is a lady of love and compassion. And in the work that we do, it's, it's a great quality to have. Compassion and love for the people that we work with. Our calling and our organization has allowed us to do the things that God has called us to do. To work with the less fortunate. To help with education. To feed little kids to make sure that they get an education so they can grow up and change the life that they are accustomed to. And we're excited about Happy Kids. We get to work all over, and, and it's fun to see kids smile, to see joy, to see hope come to their life. If you could, I would really love, after we leave today, if you could just continue to pray for us. Um, the, work, the work is difficult and sometimes. And Haiti has an interesting religious history. 90% of Haitians claim to be Catholic, and 50% of them practice voodoo. And it's a, it's a very odd mixture of two religions that come together. And with that, there's a lot of confusion. And one of our goals and our, our, 
our joys is to be able to go and to share with them just the truth, the simplicity of the gospel, that there is a loving Christ that loves them, who adores them, and they don't have to mix these two religions, but they can know about the loving, saving grace of Jesus Christ. And if you ever feel so desired to come to Haiti on a short-term missions trip, um, we would love for that to happen. There is so much work to do in Haiti. And it would be great to have partners from this church, if you feel like you wanted to, to come. It is a two-hour flight from Fort Lauderdale. And you can come be a part of the ministry and see some kids smile, share the love and joy of Christ with people. And it would be awesome to have you there. After service, if you could, please stop by our, our table. Um, we have some great pictures and a newsletter sign-up that you can do. Um, and we would love just to chat with you about Haiti because it really is a passion of our lives. This morning, I would love to continue our, our talk with the topic of hope. And I'd like to start off with just the definition so we're all on the same page. Because hope's kind of one of those mysterious kind of things. Hope is a feeling of expectation and desire for a particular thing to happen. Forgive me today if I look at my notes a little bit. I'm used to speaking with a translator. And it's really nice, actually, because you say something, then they have to say it, and you're like, okay, what's next? All right. <laughs> yes. And then you say what? It's really nice. It's funny, too, we, we have a staff of, of six Haitian guys, and my first trip to Haiti, I was known in the mountains as Grand Blanc, which means big white. They would see me coming, and there's big white coming. But now our staff, um, they don't call me Grand Blanc, and, that, and they didn't feel comfortable calling me Chris, so they call me Tall Boss. So now I'm I'm Tall Boss, and my wife is Madam Tall Boss. <laughs> and I'll meet guys outside of our, in our community. It's not just our staff. And they're like, hey, Tall Boss. <laughs> like, hey, how you doing today? Um, but back to, back to hope. Hope is the expectation, desire for a particular thing to happen. In my mind, I see hope like the wind in sails. I've personally never been sailing, but I've watched a lot of movies where they had sailing, you know, clips. And it's that moment when the wind comes and it's blowing the ship forward. And I see hope as something that helps move you forward. And there's a lot of things that we hope in. We hope in people, we hope in our careers, we hope in our government, and as Christians, we get to have hope and our unfailing love of our Heavenly Father. This morning, I'd like to talk to you from a passage in Luke, chapter 24, verse 13. It's a familiar passage. It's the walk to Emmaus. In verse 13, it starts off and says, Now, that same day, two of them were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. While they were talking with each other about everything that just happened, they discussed the things with each other. Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast, and one of them asked him, are you the only one visiting in Jerusalem? Who, who does not know about the things that have happened in these days? What things, Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all men. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one that was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, on the third day, it's been the, three days since this took place. We have two followers of Christ. 
right after, after his crucifixion, his death, who are walking together to a town, a village called Emmaus. And Jesus appears to them and starts a conversation with them. Oddly enough, a conversation about what just happened to him. But it says, the, the, the Bible says they were unable to recognize him. I love, the, the, the key phrase that stuck out to, that, to me in that passage was, he was the one we had hoped. We had hoped. The wind was taken out of their sails at this point. At this point in their journey, everything that they hoped for had been crushed. As soon as, in the Bible, as soon as Adam and Eve's fall, there was prophecies and predictions about the coming Messiah. You read throughout the whole Old Testament, and it talks about the hope, the redemption that will come from the Messiah. And here we have two men who were followers of Christ. And they were saying, this is the guy. This is the guy that, that God sent. He's the Messiah. He's the one that's going to save us. All through a Jewish person's life, they were taught from a very young age. There's hope because God's going to redeem us. And these two followers say, Jesus is that one. And then he dies. And with his death, their hope is crushed. I can only imagine how they felt. I imagine they felt discouraged, frustrated, disappointed, maybe even a little mad at God for allowing them to put such hope in a person. And let's face it, there are times in our life when we're disappointed with God. We think things should go one way, and they don't, and it's frustrating. And it's in those moments when we put our hope and it doesn't go quite like we want, that this, the wind goes out of our sails. We become discouraged. Sometimes our expectations do not match God's sovereign plan. And I imagine just as these guys felt when their Messiah had died, a lot of us have felt that way when somebody close to us has passed away. You put those hopes, that's expectation, such potential in somebody, and then they've passed away. Just a few days ago while we were driving um, to the airport, we got a call from one of our students. And he, they were a student of ours in Chicago. And I was, I was riding through uh, Port-au-Prince on the way to our, our uh, I was actually dropping our dog off so he could fly. <laughs> um, that's a funny story too. Haitians are scared of my dog and my dog is terrified of Haitians. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great combination. <laughs> Matter of fact, one, uh, the other day, I put him in my front seat, and I was driving down the, the road, and I rolled the window down just a little bit, and it was great watching their responses. Some were scared to death, some were laughing at me, and some were just absolutely shocked that I would have a dog in my front seat. Um, sorry. Anyway, <laughs> we got a call from one of our students uh, who worked with us in Chicago. And she was in Honduras on a missions trip calling us in Haiti. Thank goodness for internet. I mean, how fantastic is that? But unfortunately, she told us that one of our other students had passed away. And this, this student, his name was Jared, and he was so close and dear to Rachel and I's heart. He, he actually lived with us while we were youth pastors in Chicago. And... I remember bringing Anna home to our house, and it was, Jared was there too. It was, he was just a part of the family. And Jared had a very rough background. His mom passed away when he was very young, and his dad passed away not too many years after that. His aunt and uncle took him in, in Illinois, and they had a construction business. 
and they decided that he needed to work construction for them. He was 16, 17 years old when he started, um, wasn't able to complete high school. Through that, he had some, some substance abuse and had a really hard time just with life and what, what life had dealt him. But he came to our youth group, and he became a follower of Christ. And he was one of those kids that you just saw so much potential in his life, so much joy. God had done such a transformation. And it was an amazing, it was an amazing process just to watch. As a matter of fact, the, the girl who called, I saw her number on my phone. And as soon as I thought it, I thought, I need to call Jared and see if he wants to go on a mountain mis- uh, medical trip with me next month. And unfortunately, she told us the news that he had passed away. And he passed away alone in this hallway. And it was just such a depressing and horrible time. And it broke my heart. And I was frustrated. I imagine I felt similar to what the, these followers of Christ like. God, why would you do that? Why would you take this young guy who had so much potential, so much life, so much to give? Why would you take him away from us? And there's moments like that that just crush us. And that hope is hard to to grab hold of. I love in the Psalms, David is very honest when he writes. And in Psalms 109, he says, For I am poor and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. Have you ever had those moments where you're just wounded? Something hurts so bad, it's just, it just takes the breath out of you. Each time I drive into Port-au-Prince, which is the big city in Haiti, I look on the faces of the people that are out and about doing life, and there is a sense of hopelessness there. Haiti has over 75% an unemployment rate. The average day's wage is $2. 50% of the people can't read or write their own language, much less uh, Creole is the, is the spoken language. French is the official language. They can't read or write. And you drive through the streets and there's trash everywhere and there's, there's people that haven't eaten because they don't have the means to supply it for their, just their basic needs of life. And it's heart-wrenching. It's heart-wrenching to drive through there. We had the opportunity as happy kids to take in a little, a little girl who was born with HIV. And two years ago, Happy Kids found her in one of the villages that we worked with. She was mal- malnourished, she was starving, and this disease was just eating her body away. Well, we found a, a foster family because our family wasn't there yet. We found a foster family, a Haitian foster family that would take care of her, and we supplied all the financial supporting. And this happened for two years, and she still just wasn't developing very well. She, she didn't speak very much. She was still very skinny. She had rashes all over her body. Well, this, ho- this fa- foster family said, we can't do this anymore. You guys are going to have to take her. So she came and lived in our guest house for, um, was it four months? Three months? And I wish I had video to show you the transformation in this little girl's life. To get, we took her to a, a specialist. They put her on a, a program to help her start gaining weight. Um, and her favorite thing were suckers. You would get her a sucker and, mmm, sa bon, sa bon, mmm, sa bon, which means it's good, it's good. She loved her suckers. She started talking, she started smiling, and it started life coming back to this little girl. It was a precious experience. Her mom and dad both had HIV. They had six other kids. And two months ago, her father passed away. So we had a mother with HIV with six other kids. And she was was in a horrible time, a horrible state. She didn't have any way to provide. She didn't have any food for her family. And just seeing that hopelessness on her face was heart-wrenching. It was terrible. 
But hope is kind of a, it's kind of a flame in darkness. It kind of shares and spreads light and joy. It's kind of like being out, stuck out in the ocean with no breeze. And then finally, the wind picks up and it starts bringing you to the location that you want to go to. The second part of that scripture, the, the followers of Jesus are talking with Jesus. And then he, he reveals himself to them. And they were like, how could we not know? And our hearts were burning inside of us when he was telling us his scripture. And they were, the hope was restored. And the first thing they do is they run and they follow, they find the other believers. You will not believe what just happened. We saw Jesus. Their hope in the Messiah had returned. Right before we left to come here, uh, back to the United States, we visited Naika's family. And we had partnered with a few friends who raised money to buy them shoes, clothes, school supplies, little gifts, and we bought them food. Uh, right now we have enough food to help them live for the next two months, and then we bought them goats so they could breed the goats and they could sell and have income. The, the, above the poverty line in Haiti is 1,500 U.S. dollars. If you make that, you can survive in Haiti. And our goal is to help this family to survive. But I wanted to tell you this story because when we brought these things to this mother, I wish you could have seen her face. She's like, there's hope. There's hope for my family. we as Christians, we get to put our hope in the living God who loves us with an unfailing love. No matter what we do, he loves us. And today, I just wanted to challenge you to share that hope. Share that hope of Christ as we go through this Advent season. Share that hope. Share it with a, a kind act. Share it with telling your coworker about the love of Christ. But let's make this, this Advent season really what it's about, about looking forward to the coming of Christ and celebrating that. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today. Lord, thank you for this wonderful body of believers where I can, we can come and worship together as brothers and sisters in Christ. Lord, I ask that you would um, help us this Christmas season um, to make it not about presents, as the young man stated today in children's um, story time. Help it to make it about you, and help us as Christians to share the hope of Christ 